Hello there. Today, I'd like to take you on a journey into the history of the world's oldest tennis tournament, the Championships at Wimbledon. Wimbledon 2019 will be starting up next week, and so I thought this would be a rather good time to look back at the competition and delve into its heritage. The tournament has some rather charming and fascinating traditions, from the players wearing all white to the spectators eating strawberries and cream. So I thought it might be rather fun to take a look at those traditions and explore how this famous and beloved sporting event came into being. As usual, there will be some photographs on the accompanying slideshow for you to look at, but there's no need for you to look at them if you don't want to. If you prefer, you can just close your eyes, relax, and let my voice guide you. So, welcome to the history of Wimbledon. The championships at Wimbledon are organised by the All England Club, which was founded in 1868 and originally began as a club for playing croquet, not tennis. Back at this time, tennis wasn't really considered to be a sport at all. It was seen more as a knockabout game for very upper-class ladies and gentlemen to play on their summer lawns and it wasn't really taken seriously at all. However, it was a very popular activity among the members of the All England Croquet Club, and so, in 1876, lawn tennis, as it was then known, was introduced as a club activity, and it became so popular with the members that by the following year, the club decided to launch a competitive lawn tennis tournament. This first Wimbledon Championships began on the 9th of July in 1877 and it was held at the club's original premises which were on Walpole Road in Wimbledon. It was a male-only singles tournament and it was won in that first year by a player called Spencer Gore whose winning match was viewed by about 200 spectators. Entry admission that first year was apparently set at one shilling and the match took place on the centre court, which was so named because it was literally marked out on the grass lawn in the very middle of the club's premises. And uh, I rather like that detail because now, of course, centre court at Wimbledon is iconic and also many other tennis venues around the world name their main show court centre court. And uh, that whole tradition stems from the fact that uh, the grass court from the very first tournament at Warple Road was marked out in chalk at the centre of the club. The enthusiasm for that first tournament was pretty good, and so the club decided to make it an annual competition. Over the following years, turnout continued to grow, and in 1884, the championships were extended for the first time with the introduction of a gentleman's doubles competition and also a ladies' singles competition. The first ladies' singles title was won by a woman called Maud Watson, and she played in an ankle-length, long-sleeved white dress over a corset and a full set of petticoats. The, uh, the gentleman didn't have to put up with such an acute dress code, but even so, they did still have to play wearing full-length trousers, which uh, must have been incredibly hot. And right from the very beginning of the tournament, players of both sexes were required to wear all-white clothing. The, uh, the reason for this all-white clothing rule was um, to do with Victorian notions of propriety. Tennis, you must remember, was a very upper-class sport, and at this time, in the 1870s and 80s, no gentleman or lady would have wanted to have been seen breaking out into a sweat. Uh, sweating was considered to be highly vulgar. 
However, at the same time, playing tennis on a warm July afternoon was obviously going to make the players sweat. So white clothing was adopted because the colour white helps to hide sweat patches and so was considered to be the most genteel colour to play in. Today, 142 years later, the all-white clothing rule is still in place at Wimbledon and it's adhered to very strictly. Uh, even the top tennis stars have to submit their, uh, their clothing choices to the tournament months in advance for approval. And if there's too much colour on the trims or details of their outfits, then their outfits are roundly rejected by the club. Some of the players don't like this all-white rule, and uh, certainly nobody bothers about their sweat showing anymore. But nevertheless, I still think there's something rather stylish about seeing a player in tennis whites. There's something rather wonderful about seeing those all-white outfits contrasting with the lush green courts. And I think it all adds to the beauty of the tournament and helps to set it apart. By the beginning of the 20th century, the Wimbledon Championships were really flourishing. And in 1913, a ladies' doubles competition and a mixed doubles competition were both added to the tournament. By this time, individual tennis players were well on the way to becoming famous personalities. Uh, in the late Victorian era, you had William Renshaw, who'd won the gentleman's singles title seven times, as well as the doubles five times with his brother Ernest and who sort of became the first Wimbledon legend, really. Later on in the Edwardian era, Dorothea Lambert Chambers was also celebrated for being in the ladies' final 11 times and winning it seven times, as well as also winning a gold medal for Britain at the 1908 Olympics. However, in the 1920s, a new non-British star began to rise at Wimbledon, an incredibly charismatic player who would light up centre court and whose presence would change the championships forever. And her name was Suzanne Longlon. Longlon was a Parisian who had been born in 1899 and she played her first Wimbledon tournament at the age of 20 in 1919. During the First World War, the tournament had been suspended but when it returned, Suzanne long, long blazed a trail and issued in a whole new era. She electrified spectators with the grace and fluidity of her game, and also with the rather daring flamboyance of her outfits. Until Long Lon came along, the women players were still competing in full-length long-sleeved dresses. But she uh, caused a sensation and revolutionised the female player's uniform by shortening both her skirts and her sleeves and adopting a more loose-fitting tunic style of dress that allowed her to move freely around the court and to bound around and be much more athletic. Her freedom of movement was one of the keys to her success as a player, and uh, traditionalists were absolutely scandalised, but the public loved it. Realising the advantage of not wearing such restrictive dress, the other female players started to copy her, and so did fashion-conscious women off the court, who loved the freedom that this more practical way of dressing gave them. So, in a way, Suzanne Longlon was partly responsible for the rise of flapper style that came in in the 1920s. And, of course, this made her a style icon and a big tennis star. So many people were flocking to Wimbledon to see her play that uh, the All England Club couldn't keep up with the demand for tickets. And so, in 1922... The championships was moved from its original premises on Warpole Road to a much larger new site on Church Road. And uh, the championships have been played at that Church Road site ever since.
It's rather wonderful to think that the new centre court where Suzanne Longlon played in 1922 and where she won her fourth consecutive Wimbledon title is still the very same court where the men's and women's finals are played today. Wimbledon continued to flourish through the 1920s, and in 1927, the BBC made its first ever radio broadcast from the tournament. The matches were commentated on by a gentleman called Captain Henry Blythe Thornhill Wakelam, who was known colloquially as uh, Teddy Wakelam, and he described the action from the centre court matches to thousands of avid listeners across the country and became, for many, the voice of Wimbledon. Broadcasts from the tournament were soon an annual event, and they opened up the championships to lots of people who otherwise wouldn't have had the means or opportunity to visit Wimbledon and see the tennis for themselves. And so this was a great step forward in the evolution of the tournament. The British public's passion for tennis grew even greater during the 1930s because a homegrown hero emerged to dominate the sport. After the hiatus during World War I, more and more international players had started to come to compete at Wimbledon, and between 1919 and 1932, the gentleman singles was dominated by French, American and Australian players who carried off the title year after year. That changed, however, in 1934, when a new British star was born, and his name was Fred Perry. Perry was born in the northern English town of Stockport, and he came from a working-class background, which made him an unusual choice for a Wimbledon champion. Even today, in the UK, tennis is still a pretty elite game. It only tends to be taken up by people who have the money and resources to fund all the training and coaching and equipment that's needed to get on as a professional tennis player. However, back in the 1930s, this situation was even more extreme, and the game was still seen very much really as the sport of gentlemen. Fred Perry broke the mould in that respect, and he proved himself by winning Wimbledon three times in succession between 1934 and 1936. He probably would have gone on to win many more times over, but in 1937 he made quite a controversial decision. He decided to turn professional and actually make tennis his career by playing for money. And this meant he was automatically disqualified from competing at Wimbledon, because back then, the tournament was only open to amateur players. Wimbledon wasn't alone in this. All the major tennis championships across the world, so the tournaments in uh, France and America and Australia, were all amateur competitions at the time, and rather proud of it. This attitude probably seems extremely strange to us today, because these days, professionalism is a quality which is celebrated. But it becomes more understandable when you remember that competitive tennis had its roots in British Victorian upper-class society. Back then, being an amateur was a source of status because it denoted that you were a gentleman or lady from the upper echelons of society, and you therefore had wealth and uh, an independent income, and you weren't in need of a professional trade to earn your living. So uh, professionalism was associated very much with the working classes, and uh, frankly it was looked down on. This very elitist attitude, however, did not sit well with Fred Perry, who decided he wanted to earn his living from playing the game he was good at, and so he turned professional in 1937. And he wasn't the first big tennis star to do this. Um, Suzanne Longlon had already turned professional in 1926, 
to pursue a more lucrative paid career. And these decisions by the major tennis stars really did highlight the intractability of the tennis establishment at the time. And uh, it became particularly noticeable after Fred Perry turned professional, because in 1937, the BBC televised Wimbledon for the very first time, and British viewers tuned in to watch their hero play, only to discover that he wasn't actually competing in the tournament. This tension between professional and amateur players would continue for another 30 years, believe it or not. The four tennis major championships didn't turn professional until 1968, and they only did so really because of the immense pressure they were getting from the players. Legendary tennis stars like Rod Laver, Roy Emerson, and John Newcomb were all turning professional, and it made no sense for the most prestigious championships in the world to take place without them playing. I personally feel that the players were right to protest about the amateur status of the leading tennis competitions, because both Wimbledon and the other tournaments had always been commercial successes. Spectators had been paying to get in to watch the players since the very beginning, and, uh, you know, they were buying programs, they were buying food, they were buying drinks, and uh, it seemed that everyone associated with the competitions was making money out of them, apart from the players. So it was uh, a good innovation, I think, when the tournament finally went professional in 1968 and the open era was born and interestingly it was Wimbledon that spearheaded this change. It was the first of the four Grand Slam tournaments to decide to turn professional and once it had the other three quickly followed suit. This isn't the first time that Wimbledon in spite of its traditions has uh, led the way with change and innovation. It's done it most notably in recent years by being the first Grand Slam tournament to add a roof to its centre court. Uh, it did this in 2009 in order to allow play to continue on the main show court later into the evening and, more importantly, to allow play to continue while it was raining. Because, sir, uh, even in July, the British weather is notoriously unreliable, and uh, every year there seems to be at least one or two rain delays at Wimbledon. Over other issues, the tournament has sadly not been particularly innovative, and has uh, allowed its elitist Victorian origins to uh, become too entrenched, I think. Wimbledon was, for example, the last Grand Slam to offer equal prize money to men and women. And uh, even more shockingly, the All England Club actually banned black and Jewish players from competing at Wimbledon until the early 1950s, which I personally find quite disturbing. Uh, fortunately, once the ban had been lifted, a wonderful Wimbledon champion emerged who did a lot to highlight just how ridiculous those club prejudices had been. And that player was Althea Gibson. She was an American tennis player who had already won the French Open in 1956. And in 1957, she won Wimbledon for the first time. And then she came back to win it again the following year, in 1958. Other great winners of the ladies singles tournament have included Helen Wills, who won the championships eight times in the amateur era, Billie Jean King, who won it six times, two in the amateur era and four in the open professional era, and then more recently Steffi Graf and Serena Williams, who have both won it seven times, although Serena is still playing so she could possibly win a few more titles yet. The queen of the ladies' singles championships in the open era, however, is Martina Navratilova, 
who has won the championships an astonishing nine times. On the gentleman's side of the game, Bjorn Borg has won the tournament five times during the Open era, Pete Sampras has won it seven times, and Roger Federer has won it eight times. He currently holds the record for the most gentlemen's final singles ever won, although again, like Serena Williams, Federer is still playing, so it's just about possible that he could add another Wimbledon title to his crown before he retires. The youngest ever woman to lift the trophy at Wimbledon in the open era is Martina Hingis, who was only 16 years old when she won in 1997, and the youngest male player to win was Boris Becker, who was just 17 years old when he lifted the trophy. At the other end of the scale, Roger Federer is the oldest man to win the tournament at the age of 35, that was back in 2017, and Serena Williams is the oldest woman to win it at 34, although her record only applies to the Open era. Back in the amateur era in 1908, a British player called Charlotte Cooper Sterry managed to win the title at the ripe old age of 37, having already won the title four times previously, and also having come back to the game after having two children. All of these great champions have had the opportunity to lift up one of the two singles Wimbledon trophies. For the gentlemen, it's the Silver Gilt Cup, which stands 47 centimetres high and bears the inscription All England Lawn Tennis Club Single-Handed Championship of the World. And for the ladies, their trophy is the Venus Rosewater Dish, which is a rather beautiful silver salver measuring 48 centimetres in diameter, and which is actually a Victorian copy of a 16th century pewter dish that was made by a French engraver called Francois Brio. Both trophies were initially presented in the 1880s, and they both remain the property of the All England Club. The tournament winners are presented with their trophies immediately after their wins, but uh, once they've shown them off to the crowds, they then have to give them back to the club, where they remain under lock and key, and uh, the champions are given three-quarter size replicas to keep instead. Since 1969, those trophies have been awarded to the players by the president of the All England Club, who is Prince Edward, the Duke of Kent, who's a cousin to Queen Elizabeth II, and uh, who continues to attend the tournament. I think he's 83 this year, but I have no doubt that he'll be there if he can be. One interesting piece of uh, historical Wimbledon trivia is that the prince's uncle, who was also the Queen's father, King George VI, actually played at Wimbledon. In uh, 1926, when he was still Prince Albert, he played in the gentlemen's doubles tournament, but uh, sadly lost in the first round. No member of the royal family has attempted to take to the court since him, but uh, over the years, quite a few royals have attended Wimbledon, the Queen is said to be not a particular tennis fan, but nevertheless she attended in 1977 and was there to present the trophy to Virginia Wade during the Queen's Silver Jubilee year. And uh, more recently, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, who are both tennis fans, I think, the Duchess in particular, as was the Duke's mother, Princess Diana. During her lifetime, she was often seen watching her favourite players at the tournament. For many Wimbledon fans, like myself, it's the traditions of Wimbledon that make it so special and seem to set it apart from other tennis tournaments. One of those rather delightful traditions, which dates right back to the Victorian era, is the eating of a bowl of strawberries and cream. Spectators have been doing this while watching Wimbledon matches ever since the 19th century, and uh, the tradition came about because 
In the time before strawberries were available all year round, they were quite a rare treat. The British strawberry season was extremely short, but it happened to coincide beautifully with the timing of the championships in July. And because there was no refrigeration at this time, both the strawberries and the cream were incredibly expensive to store for any length of time. And so they were a rather expensive and exclusive indulgence. And consequently, they became rather fashionable and were relished by the upper-class spectators of Victorian Wimbledon. Strawberries and cream are still devoured in huge quantities every year at the tournament. And other luxurious treats associated with the championships include Pims, which is a gin-based cocktail served with lemonade and lots of fruit, and Champagne, which has always been a favourite at Wimbledon, and still is. I think I read that uh, these days the average consumption over the course of the two-week tournament is uh, estimated at nearly 22,000 bottles. However, one refreshingly ordinary drink that's also associated with the championships is Robinson's Barley Water, and that's a soft, lemony drink that was actually invented at the tournament in 1935. The story goes that Mr. Smedley Hodgson, who was an enterprising sales rep for Robinson's Barley Powder, was attending a Wimbledon match, and he noticed how hot and exhausted the tennis players looked. So he quickly mixed up a combination of cold water, lemon juice, sugar and Robinson's barley powder and gave it to the contestants to drink, and it did the job. The combination was such a hit with the players that the drink became a Wimbledon staple, and today Robinson's lemon barley is still the official soft drink of the Wimbledon Championships. Although you can also buy a bottle from most British supermarkets and take it home to drink while you watch the BBC TV coverage of Wimbledon. As a young girl, I did precisely that. I sat at home year after year, avidly watching the Wimbledon coverage on the television. But uh, as I didn't have either the money or the opportunity to go to London and attend the tournament for myself, it was many years before I was actually able to go there. My moment finally came in 2001, which was back in the day before the roof had been added to Centre Court. And there was so much rain in the second week of the tournament that the men's final had to be postponed until the following Monday, after the official end of the championships. This meant that for one time only, all the tickets to the men's final were sold on the gate, on a first-come, first-served basis. And I knew this would probably be my one and only chance to attend a Wimbledon final. So my husband and I drove through the night to London, queued up through the dawn in Wimbledon Park, and managed to get seats for Centre Court. It turned out to be a very magical day, not just for me, but also for the winner of the tournament that year, who was Goran Ivanisevic. And previous to 2001, he'd actually played in three separate men's finals at Wimbledon, and he hadn't won any of them. He'd always been the runner-up. He'd also been injured previously, and uh, no one expected him to ever really compete for the title again. But that year, in a fairy tale journey, he came back, made it right through to the final once again, and this time he won. He competed against the lovely Australian player, Pat Rafter, and uh, it was a dream come true for me to watch them both, to see these two brilliant players battle for the trophy on Wimbledon Centre Court. It was an amazing experience, and it's turned into an amazing memory that I'll treasure forever, I think. 
This year, in 2019, Wimbledon begins on Monday the 1st of July and will run for two weeks, as usual, until Sunday the 14th of July. Whether you're lucky enough to have a ticket for the championships, or whether, like me, you'll be at home, watching on the television or listening on the radio, I hope you have a lovely time following the tennis. I hope you get to relax with a glass of Pims or a bowl of strawberries and cream. And I hope you really enjoy Wimbledon Fortnight. That brings us to the end of our talk about the history of Wimbledon. I hope you've enjoyed exploring this great sporting tradition with me. And I hope that you can join me again soon for another softly spoken audio adventure. Until then, thank you for your company. Goodbye.